Good evening, welcome. So glad you all are here. And just want to acknowledge the fact that the singer Galen is here with us who sang the beautiful piece that was played during the introduction period. And I'm, I feel honored that she's here. Galen, thank you for coming. You're getting lots of claps. <laughs> I'm very honored to be here. Thank you. So I, my name is Pamela Patton. I'm the director of pastoral ministries at All Souls. And I also run the Buddhism also run and the Buddhism and Mind. Sorry, I'm suddenly echoing. Um, I also run the Buddhism and Mindfulness programming. And of course, as you've noticed in our material promoting the event, Buddhism and Mindfulness at All Souls is co-hosting this event with Music of Eva New York. And it's been a great honor for me to work so closely with Music of Eva. I've never done that before. And it's been a lot of fun and interesting and um, mind expanding. So Buddhism and Mindfulness is a program that runs uh, several uh, different sessions per week on meditation, on mindfulness. We have guest teachers on a pretty regular basis. We're running a course on dealing with difficult emotions. Dr. Pilar Jennings will be teaching that. So we have lots going on. I won't go into more detail, but you're most welcome to email me at Pamela at allsoulsnyc.org to learn more about it. I'd love to hear from you. And then, of course, our co-host of this program is Music of Eva New York, which is a program that was founded in 1977, also housed at All Souls Church. It's a chamber choir presenting a, a broad repertoire of new compositions and classic masterworks. The mission is to bring world-class music to a widening community through its annual concert series, outreach programs, and an ambitious artistic vision. So tonight we'll have a discussion among the three panelists, Richard, Alejandro, and Trent, and I'll be just sort of conducting the flow of it, but um, you'll mostly hear from them, and we'll have time for your questions. So you can put your questions into the chat in the meantime, and I'll keep track if you'd like to do that, or you can wait and just ask by raising your hand after we finish um, we finish the discussion. So please do think of questions. We'd love to hear them. So we'll begin by having each of the panelists introduce themselves. We'll start with Alejandro Hernandez Valdez, who is the conductor and artistic director of Music of Viva New York. So Alejandro, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, as Pamela was saying, um, I am the artistic director of uh, Music of Viva NY and of All Souls Church since 2015. I also uh, run a music festival in Texas, uh, the Victoria Bach uh, Festival. And I've been doing that since 2017. And I also uh, co-founded and I'm the artistic director of the New Orchestra of Washington in Washington, DC. And it's a great privilege to be able to, to share this time with, with all of you. I wish we had time to hear Alejandro's whole life story, which is amazing. I've had, I've had the chance to hear him speak a few times. So that was a very succinct um, <laughs> Uh, capturing of Alejandro's responsibilities and talents. Trent, who is the assistant director and organist for Music of Viva, would you introduce yourself, Trent? Yes, I would just like to say, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here and um, I'm excited about exploring uh, the music of uh, Richard and um, a little bit about myself. Um, I have many musical interests as a musician. I am, of course, the organist and assistant music director of All Souls Church uh, here in New York City. Um, I am also uh, the music director and conductor of the Oratorio Singers of Westfield, New Jersey. It's a, a choral organization that performs uh, traditional masterworks as well as little known pieces, as well as a lot of world premieres. And as a conductor of the organization, uh, I have been encouraged by the board and others. Uh, they have premiered numerous works of mine, cantatas, I think uh, three oratorios. Uh, in addition to that, I've written uh, for other media, I've written for concertos, chamber music, uh, and three years ago I was commissioned to write an opera called Kenyatta, based upon the life of Jomo Kenyatta, the first uh, president of Kenya. Uh, I'm also a big fan of the theater organ, and as a theater organist, a th organist I um, accompany silent films, so I've been accompanying silent films for, I don't know, about 15 years now. 
Um, and that's one of the most thrilling things that I get to do. There's a little bit of prepared music, but there's a lot of uh, improvisational music that takes place as well. Uh, one of my great joys. And the last thing I'll mention is that, that I have always had a great interest in the recording arts and sciences. Uh, well, I was a double major when I was a student and uh, doing a lot of sound recording of orchestras and organ concerts, especially, uh, and lots of things. So I've always had that interest. And uh, I guess when I came to New York City as a grad student, I decided to throw all my um, eggs into the basket of being a musician. So <laughs> that's just a little bit about me. And I'm glad you did, Trent. It's a great pleasure working with Trent as well. And now I'd like for Richard, who I'll just first say is a dear friend of mine. We met at our Dharma Center, where some other people are from who are here tonight. Um, Shanti Deva Center, and we've become very close friends. We teach Buddhism classes together, and we teach meditation at Monday Night Hospitality at All Souls together, which is our soup kitchen program. And it's it's really, our friendship is very important to me, and I'm delighted that he's here. So please go ahead and introduce yourself, Richard. Hi, thank you, Pamela, and I'm very, very moved by uh, what, you know, what you've said, uh, all, uh, all of it reciprocated. It's really a joy to know you. And thank you so much, uh, uh, Trent and Alejandro and everybody from Musica Viva for um, uh, basically letting me crash your party. This is just wonderful. And uh, I'm just delighted to meet you and to, and to see everybody here. My name is Richard Einhorn. Um, I'm a composer. Um, I started writing music when I was 15 when uh, we formed a multimedia band and uh, multimedia group in my high school. And I um, wrote a, a piece of electronic music that featured police sirens and jackhammers. Um, after graduating from Columbia University, I did a bunch of uh, feature films and then got a job as a record producer for Columbia Records, um, where I worked with such characters as Yo-Yo Ma and the New York Philharmonic and Glenn Gould. I had the opportunity to work with him and some other artists, but I always felt that I was a composer and not a record producer. And so uh, uh, after about five years, I quit and I've been freelancing as a composer ever since. Um, you'll hear some of uh, two of my major pieces uh, tonight, and and uh, a couple of other pieces that are sh that are that are shorter. And um, I think um, you get a sense of my music. Um, it's been really an honor to work with um, with Pamela on this, and with everybody, with Trent and Alejandro. And I look forward to um, introducing you to my music. Thank you, Richard. And I also want to acknowledge Brian and Danielle, who had a lot to do with shaping this event. And Brian is behind the scenes, keeping us, keeping our act together in so many ways. And I count on him in, you know, all the time. And I'm super grateful to him and also to Danielle, who helps us a lot. So thank you very much to both of them as well. I'd like to start with a question and ask all three of you to answer it. And my question is, does a higher power play a part in your music making? And of course you can define higher power however you wish, but I would love to hear from each of you about whether a higher power plays a part in your music making. And why don't we start with you, Trent, and, and I'll just call on each of you to keep the flow moving. Uh, that's a very good question, a higher power. Um, I believe that I have evidence that there is help uh, in the creation of the music that uh, I am a part of, whether it is as a performer or as a composer. I think in particular as a composer, um, my experience often is that um, I have a blank sheet of paper or maybe no paper at all and walking around the living room or um, uh, outside or just imagining things or reading poetry and uh, musical ideas uh, come to me or impressions come to me or words or visions um, and from the, that kind of uh, impulse, I begin to write and I use uh, whatever training that I have uh, uh, to form these ideas into something coherent and that is satisfying, at least to me. And uh, I often find that when I have finished uh, writing a piece of music, even though I have some general or specific ideas on how or what I want to achieve, I could never have predicted exactly that it would have turned out that way. And I'm actually often uh, even shocked that maybe uh, that it turns out maybe better than I had imagined. And it feels as if um, there's something at work 
beyond just my own input. Where do these ideas come from? How are they developed? Perhaps I've developed some skills over time about how to treat ideas and motives and harmonies and sounds, but I have always felt that there is something, I don't know, there's something greater than myself that's also part of it that I can't uh, uh, put my fingers on. So um, uh, perhaps that is a higher power. Uh, perhaps it's, it's some intuition. Perhaps it's uh, something that uh, I've experienced in the past and has brought to the fore. I don't know, but I, I feel like I'm not alone in the process, certainly, of writing music. Thank you. Thank you. And how about you, Alejandro? Well, I, I, I do believe in higher power, and I think it manifests itself uh, through nature, uh, through the innocence of children, the wisdom of older people, uh, and definitely through music. I think music is a manifestation of a higher power in, in my view. And I have a hard time separating the two. To me, spirituality is music and music is spirituality. And you know, there's a, a quote by Beethoven. Um, he, he, he said that, uh, uh, how did it go? Spirituality, or rather music is the uh, mediator between spirituality or the spiritual life and the physical life. And I think that is very true. So I think anything that has to do with, with, with music is somehow connected to, to a higher power. And again, within music, the manifestation of that, maybe just the inspiration of a moment, uh, uh, perhaps as Jen was saying, you know, uh, something that motivates you to write a beautiful phrase or maybe a beautiful movement or, or, or just you know, that magic moment that you find yourself in when you're uh, uh, a musician, a performer, and everything kind of falls into place and you do see God, if you want to call it, within those moments and that you can, you can almost touch it. It's, it's very present. It's quite lovely to hear you talk about it. Um, Richard, how about you? Oh boy, how am I supposed to follow that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, you know, um, it's 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 very odd. Um, I've written pieces about um, uh, Saint John of the Cross, uh, Joan of Arc, of course, um, Saint Francis, which is what um, uh, Galen's beautiful piece is about. Um, uh, the the uh, the beautiful singing of Galen's piece, of course. The the um, uh, I've written I've written also um, all sorts of other pieces um, with spiritual uh, um, subjects. And I, I honestly have not really thought about the issue of whether or not uh, where the ideas come from in terms of a higher power or in, any, in anything else. I'm just, uh, what I can say is that there are times, um, well, it's kind of like Stra um, what, something that Stravinsky once said about the rite of spring. He said, I am the vessel through which the rite of spring passed. Um, in other words, he kind of is sort of looking and observing at uh, a process that's taking place outside of him. And he has the privilege and the honor of kind of writing it down in a certain sort of way. And on those rare moments when I've come close to that, it's one of the most extraordinary and uh, experiences of my life. You know, when you're just in the zone and time slips away and you just simply don't even know what happened. Um, if that's a higher power, if that's evidence of a higher power, so be it. But um, I, I think that for me, the 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 where I am focusing on is just trying to get into that zone, and that zone is very um, is um, something that I've only been privileged to have a few times. And boy, I would like to get back to that. Thank you very much. I wonder. I, I wondered how you would respond in particular, since we share a spiritual interest in Buddhism. Um, if you would incorporate the Dharma at all in that, but but um, no no pressure. I would definitely say that it is a that it is a function of causes and conditions, and that it is definitely dependent on uh, on on uh, on things that are going on in a very 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 subtle and interesting way. The, the, you respond, I, I respond to music and often the original idea is just a starting point. And sometimes that idea gets turned around, flipped around, 
um, turned around and flipped around and then processed in all sorts of ways. And the way in which that happened is um, uh, very, very much dependent on all the conditions that are going on. So I guess if there is a dharmic connection, it's that for sure. Great. Well, thank you for elaborating with a little, little uh, bit of Buddhism in there. Um, so now what we'll do, as promised in, in uh, when we advertise the event, we're going to share some of Richard's music. And we're going to move now to our first piece that we'll share, Maxwell's Demon. Richard will introduce it, and then we'll share it with you. And then Alejandro and Trent will respond to it. So please go ahead and introduce it, Richard. Terrific. Yeah, um, I had um, just finished um, writing a, a group of pieces. I'd become very interested in um, spirituality and religion um, as a subject matter for a variety of reasons that maybe we can get into later. But I had started to do a lot of research on Christianity and then ultimately Catholic mysticism. And um, I was quite taken with the life of, um, of uh, St. Francis of Assisi. So um, I wrote a piece for my friend Galen, Galen Brandt, um, for four voices and Galen performed all the piece, parts of that. But I also wrote pieces um, based on other um, Catholic mystical subjects and I needed to take a break. And I remembered that I had an idea which was, which was a very strange idea, a musical idea. What would a, um, what would a violin sound like if in fact it was really a rock and roll drum set in disguise? And uh, this idea haunted me. And then one day I met a violinist who early in the evening, she would play with her rock band. And then late at night, uh, early in the evening, she would play um, Beethoven concertos. And then late at night, she would jam with her rock band. And I said, this is exactly the kind of person I need to write a piece for. And that became Maxwell's Demon. Um, there's actually four of them. You'll hear number four. And um, much to my astonishment and Mary's astonishment, Mary Rowell's astonishment, uh, the violinist, it ended up being choreographed for the New York City Ballet and became the, the score to a beautiful ballet called Red Angels. And I think um, that probably should suffice as an introduction. It became a hit ballet quite, quite unexpectedly. So we'll show you the, the ballet and of course you'll hear the music. I just want to warn you that the video is blurry for the ballet. We were not able to get a really crystal clear video, unfortunately. So you'll have to use your imagination a little bit, but the music of course will be fine and you'll hear that just fine. So uh, Brian will share with us now Maxwell's Demon and the Red Angels Ballet.
Ah. As a big fan of the ballet and a big fan of Richards, and it's quite quite a remarkable. I've seen it many many times, and, and I enjoy it very much. Um, so I wanted to let you know before we have Alejandro and Trent respond. If anybody did not see that in the big screen, you need to set your view on gallery view. So uh, if that was an issue for anyone, one person chatted me, she was having some trouble with that. So I just wanna let you know because we'll be seeing a couple more videos and I wanna make sure you see them as best you can. So um, I'll ask you Alejandro, could you respond in any way you see fit? It's just fantastic music and, and quite a workout for the violinist for sure. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, I think it's, it's remarkable, you know, full of energy. And, you know, that now that we're talking about spirituality, uh, there's a very strong spiritual component to this because of the, I, I find when, when music has a repetitive nature in a good way, you know, it gets you into a state of mind that is almost like what a mantra does, right? Gets you, gets your mind in a place that is almost outside of your body. I have that same sensation when I listen to, you know, some of the great work by Philip Glass, for example, listening to uh, Satyagraha, the opera, or Agnaten, you know, you get into that place where you're almost floating from your, from your seat. Uh, uh, and, and I think Richard's music, uh, in, in this particular example, it does that. It, it almost makes you forget about time, and you're just kind of floating and taking it all in, but it has a meditative quality to it, in, in, in my view. Trent, would you like to comment? Sure. Well, my first response is uh, that is so cool. It is just such a cool experience. Um, and um, some of the things that I really like about it, uh, first of all, exactly what Alejandro is saying, there's something about oftentimes when you have uh, imaginative repetition of ideas or motives, um, that it can put you in sort of a trance-like state or put your body and your mind in some state where you are, you know, you're outside of your body. And I think that's what happens in this piece. And I think that it seems to also have this uh, very lively, ebullient burst of energy that um, that you have for the full, full four or five minutes or whatever it is, um, that's just energizing. And uh, one of the things that I really like about it um, is um, sort of the improvisational nature of it. It has almost a sense as if the violinist is making it up as he or she plays, and as if the dancers come out one by one, and as if they improvise. What's going on? It's just like this joy of being alive, you know. And um, you know, um, being spiritual. I, I don't necessarily think that being spiritual always has to mean that you're quiet and inward. I think that the joy of being alive is another aspect of spirituality, and I think that this piece uh, uh, shows that in abundance. Richard, do you want to respond? I'll just I'll just say that um, what what both the Trent and Alejandro have said is very very kind. And uh, just to pick up on one thing that they they both discussed, which is this issue of spirituality and and uh, basically mood and the notion that something needs to be quiet in order to be spiritual is not necessarily the case. Sometimes that's true, but um, one of the real great joys of um, my exploration of uh, Tibetan Buddhism is to, is to have learned um, and to listen to so many different uh, rituals where it is far from quiet <laughs> and, and far from, uh, far from uh, uh, translate in trance like in the way of um, uh, uh, a, a lot of music that that is that that is spiritual a lot of it is very very intense and overwhelming some of it is clearly music that influenced Edgar Perez for example a very very experimental composer and so I think that I think that there's much more to spirituality than just simply one modality. And I think that that's the important thing for me, is to explore all those different ways of, of expressing, uh, you know, of expressing something that has very little to do with me personally, but has to do with something a little bit larger than myself. So maybe I have thought about, about all this more than I, than I said I did. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like being asked. Uh, Richard, while we're on, the, on this piece, Somebody asked, Constance asked, who is the choreographer and how did that person learn about the music? 
That's a great question. Uh, the choreographer is Ulysses Dove, and I'm sorry that I didn't mention his name er earlier. He's a, bril he's a brilliant uh, choreographer. He tragically died in his 40s, and he um, uh, he heard about the he heard about the music through his manager, who just turned out to who who was a personal friend of mine before before she started to manage Ulysses, and I gave her a tape of, of my music. And uh, like the next day, I get a phone call. Uh, uh, um, guess what? Ulysses has got a commission for the New York City Ballet and he's gonna use your music. And I went, what? I mean, it took me quite a while to process what was going on, but um, it turned out to be all, all good. And we had an all-star cast for the first performance. Peter Ball, Darcy Kistler, I mean, uh, Albert Evans, and I'm sorry, the, the other, other dancer um, uh, escapes my mind, but uh, Ulysses managed to get four of the greatest dancers in the world at the time uh, together. It was extraordinary. Is it still in their repertory, Richard? Oh yes, as a matter of fact, it was recently it was recently performed uh, online as a virtual concert about uh, three months ago, I think. It's also in the repertory of the Pacific Northwest Ballet and also in the Nevada Ballet and several other places. And Mary still performs it, uh, Mary Rowell and several other violinists, uh, it's an incredibly difficult piece, um, perform it often and regularly both as a concert piece and as encores. Thank you. Thank you so much for elaborating on that as well. And um, glad for the questions to understand better. There was just one last question Wendy, about it. Yeah, wondering. Wendy, the fourth dancer was Wendy Whalen. I'm very, very embarrassed. Somebody Thank put you. that in the chat. Don't worry. Thank you. Whenever, yes. oh, so whenever I forget things in any of my programs, somebody always helps me in the chat. So we have we have wonderful people here helping us with our anything we forget. Don't worry about it. But there was one other question about whether the violinist performs the piece live in uh, when it's danced. No. Yes Absolutely. or no? Yes. yes. All the time. It's always performed live when it's danced. And it's always something where um, I, I just can't, you know, I mean, it is a very, very difficult piece. And um, it's a, it's it was designed that way. It was designed to showcase uh, Mary's Mary's, you know, virtuosity and also her rock and roll soul. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm going to move to another question. And I uh, would like for the three of you to comment on a quote that I picked out from a book called Talks with Great Composers that in a conversation between the four of us a few days ago, uh, Trent raised. And he mentioned this book by Arthur Abal, which is um, in which Arthur Abal it interviews many composers, in, including Johannes Brahms, toward the end of his life. And when there's a section titled, How Brahms Contacted God. And Brahms says, it cannot be done merely by willpower working through the conscious mind, which is an extraordinary product of the physical realm and perishes with the body. It can only be accomplished by the soul powers within. Straight away, the ideas flow in upon me directly from God, and not only do I see distinct themes in my mind's eye, but they are clothed in the right forms, harmonies, and orchestration. Measure by measure, the finished product is revealed to me when I am in those rare, inspired moods. I have to be in a semi-trance condition to get such results, a condition when the conscious mind is in temporary abeyance and the subconscious is in control. For it is through the subconscious mind that the inspiration comes. I have to be careful, however, not to lose consciousness, otherwise the ideas fade away. And each of you have alluded to this, I think, when I asked you the first question a bit, but I'd love for you to respond to that particular quote and it, with you know, further thoughts about that idea of the trance-like state and, and holding on to it. So let's see, why don't you go first, Richard? You know, um, th that's about as eloquent and as accurate as I can as I can picture it, and um, I have to say that you can you can hear it, you can hear that often um, in 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 jazz. For example, I'm thinking I'm thinking of John Coltrane solos where you just get the sense that this is somebody who is just simply um, 
who Coltrane, Coltrane himself in a certain sense has disappeared and there is something else going on. Um, it's really, really uncanny. And those of us who write music, who, who, who write it all out, in other words, who don't um, expect a performer to improvise, we try in some way to, to go to that same place and to, and to create that same situation by writing it out. But I can't improve on what Brahms said. That's about as close as I can. It, it, it's, something, it's something that I just don't, you know, I just don't try to um, analyze too much because it's a little bit like being a centipede, you know, and analyzing how you walk. You just don't <laughs> want to think about it too much. Because you know? <laughs> then you, you just, you know, you just collapse and go in a zillion different directions at once. But he said it well. Thank you. Alejandro, how about you? Well, that's a wonderful quote uh, by, by Brahms because you know he was a man of short words or, or few words. Uh, so it's it's extraordinary to, to hear that from him. Um, so the uh, I think the ideal for a musician, whether you are a composer or performer, is to get into that trance state, right? You really aim for that, and you want to have it for as long as possible. And it can happen. It's what they call, you know, getting in the zone, right? And we all work towards that, towards that moment. And you know, it, it, it has become such an obsession for musicians that, as you all know, during the '60s and the '70s, a lot of musicians actually used uh, enhanced uh, uh, techniques. Let's put it that way, <laughs> to get into a trance, uh, because that is ultimately what you're wanting to do. That usually has diminishing returns, unfortunately. So that's, uh, I don't recommend it at all. Uh, but uh, definitely what, what you're trying to do as a performer, as a composer is to get into that, that frame of mind, which, which is doable if you, if you focus on the right things. And, you know, I've composed very little in comparison to what, what Richard and Trent have been able to do with their uh, life as composers. But, but I've, I've, you had moments where I do feel like there's certain trends and there's that famous anecdote of of uh, of Handel right when he wrote Messiah in just a few days that he locked himself in a room and he came out and he basically said to his assistant that you know he had been in this trance for the entire time and that the music just kind of passed through him and really the music kind of sounds like that it's so incredibly inspired that you do you do feel that there's a special touch there that maybe came from a from a you know from a very uh, powerful being uh, and uh, superhuman almost. Um, so yeah, I, I I do believe that's uh, being a trans is certainly a goal for many of us, and and music can can lead you to that. You know, what, oh, just one second. Oh. You know what helps to induce that kind of state is a tight deadline. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so what, what was the quote by Bernstein? He said, uh, for great things to happen or something like that, you need, uh, you need a, a plan and not quite enough time or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, I, I do think that that is a great quote from uh, Brahms. I, I do wish, though, that um, uh, that a higher power would speak to me with such clarity about orchestration, harmony, <laughs> musical ideas. I seem to have to struggle for each one of those. Um, but uh, it's interesting how he mentions, and I remember reading uh, that book for the first time and, 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 and reading that passage and similar passages from other composers. And I was like, wow, somebody else also experiences this? This is incredible. Um, and dare I say, I mean, Alejandro mentioned the 60s um, and the 70s and the current day and how, um, how being transported to another place while you're creatively working uh, can be so otherworldly and productive. I mean, there have been times, uh, uh, creative period times where you don't eat, you don't sleep, time goes by so fast, you don't even realize the world that's going around, going around you. Um, and I almost dare to say that oftentimes that trance-like trance -like state can be like better than real life itself. I mean, to actually be in this otherworldly plane where that you can't describe, that uh, you have emotional feelings, that you're actually making progress, that you're in a, in a realm that, um, 
that it's otherworldly almost. It's like it's almost better than than the mundane, you know, eat your breakfast, uh, you know, do the dishes, take out the trash. You know, it's it's almost on a just a higher plane of of, of mental reality. And it's like I want to go back to that place again. Um, but I think I do believe uh, that Richard is right. Deadlines do help uh, induce that state because it's it's while you're working, and it's and it takes a while. I find for me, it takes a while to get to that place where you're so focused enough that you're able to uh, to work creatively. Um, and oftentimes, you can spend minutes, hours. Uh, not productive and not being able to reach that state because the phone rang again, or there's a text message or, you know, uh, I mean, for me as a composer, the most productive time is between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. Why? Because I can get into that zone, the phone doesn't ring, the, the, you know, everyone's asleep, I've already eaten, you know, so um, it's, it's sort of accessing uh, some place that, um, that uh, makes you become the best that you can be. And then when it's then when you've written it down and you've experienced it, it's like where did that come from? I I just wrote it down, but how did how did it all come together to be uh, something so desirable, but in a way almost unexpected? So um, it's a great quote, and um, <laughs> I look forward to going to that place again sometime in the future. <laughs> Well, thank you for recommending the book, Trent. It, I, I really appreciated what little I was able to read between when you told me about it a couple of days ago and today. Um, and thank you all for responding to that. It's quite inspiring. I, I, you know, to see how your talent manifests and 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 plays out. So, speaking of trance-like states, we'll move now to Richard's Mani Mantra. And uh, Richard will introduce it. Then uh, Brian will show it to us, and we'll have Alejandro and Trent comment on it. Richard, you're muted. You have to unmute. Okay. The um, basically um, the money mantra is a very very short uh, phrase. A mantra is basically a phrase in Buddhism that gets repeated over and over again and has a kind of a a um, spiritual meaning that is. Uh, very, very difficult to define. And the idea with, with these mantras is to repeat them over and over again for various, various purposes. In the case of the Mani Mantra, it's very short. There's only a few words. It's Om Mani Padme Hum. And the uh, meaning of it is that it's tied to a specific Buddha. Uh, there are many Buddhas in Buddhism. There's not just one Buddha. And this particular Buddha um, is called um, Avalokiteshvara in, in, in Sanskrit and in Tibetan Chenrezig. And Chenrezig is the Buddha of compassion. And the, um, when you do perform it ritualistically, and we have a, um, a nun here, so if I'm making a mistake, please, um, please uh, uh, correct me, Venerable. Um, but it, I believe that when you do chant it realistically, you perform it at, uh, 21 times or in increments of 21. Uh, what I what happened was that early on in the pandemic, I had two singers ask me for some music, and I've always loved the traditional melody with which you chant um, Om Mani Padme Hum, and so I decided to set it to music for them because they wanted to do something which was using all the new technology that was going out. So what you'll hear is um, two singers, uh, Crossley Hahn and Kristen uh, Dubenion uh, Smith, um, perform uh, the, this, uh, this mantra virtually. Uh, we did this in uh, early April. Oh. 
So please, Alejandro and Trent, would love to hear from you. Go ahead, Alejandro. Uh, yeah, I think it's extraordinary. I always admire composers like Richard that can do uh, make miracles with simple means, you know, just two voices, right? Something that is extraordinary. Um, I, I love the combination of two voices in the same register. It's one of my favorite things and only works with voices. If I try to do the same thing on the piano, it doesn't work. You know, if you play exactly the same notes, it just doesn't have the same power, the same impact. So it goes to show you the power of the, 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 the human voice has. And one of, some of my favorite moments, in, uh, moments rather in music uh, have, have to do with that. Uh, two treble voices singing in the same register in very close intervals, either, uh, you know, sometimes in unison, sometimes a minor second apart, or uh, uh, I don't know, a major second apart, just, just very close together. And I, I can tell you uh, portions like uh, Abraham and Isaac by Britain, when, when God speaking to Abraham had to have that quality or uh, Satyagraha when, when Nefertiti and, and sorry, Akhenaten, pardon me, Akhenaten and Nefertiti are singing with each other. Akhenaten is a, a countertenor and Nefertiti is a soprano, but they're singing exactly in the same register. It's amazing when you hear those moments and they're simple, but it's, there's something about the frequencies that just, to me, at, at least it gives me, it gives me goosebumps. Um, yeah, so, so really extraordinary uh, things uh, that can be done with, again, with just two voices, but you need someone with, with the imagination of, 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 of Richard to, to, to pull it off. But yeah, yeah, bravo. Yes, I, I think Alejandro, I think you hit the nail right on the head. I mean, that the, there's the, not all composers are able to achieve great results with simplicity. Um, two voices unaccompanied. Uh, just a marvelous combination. Um, and um, the mantra, the, rep the repetition um, of the phrases and the ideas, again, sorts begins to put me into a, a almost sort of trance-like meditative state. And this definitely uh, spiritually or sp using spirituality puts me maybe more in sort of an inward kind of reflective, uh, contemplative type of, um, of mood. Um, and uh, the simple means by which that it is achieved um, is again, extraordinary. Um, and it's, it's, you know, I think of spirituality sometimes as, is, as it's related to religion and as it is related to secular music, uh, you know, this being closer or in the religious uh, realm. Um, and it, uh, it, it makes me want to look upward uh, as if uh, a higher power would be there, or it makes me want to uh, be reflective on uh, uh, my views on the world around me, or the, the, the tree that's growing next to me, or the, the child holding her mother's hand as they walk by. You know, it, it sort of brings a certain humanity, a uh, certain um, introspection, and even observation of simple things around me that I think is um, uh, beneficial to the human spirit. Uh, and perhaps maybe that can be one of the benefits of spirituality is how it benefits uh, uh, not only your view, uh, but uh, yourself personally, and um, maybe expands your own individual universe. So bravo. So maybe I think what we'll do is move right into Voices of Light, Richard and have you talk a little bit about Voices of Light, and then we'll show that and, and uh, hear from Trent and Alejandro about it and continue with some questions. Sure, sure. Um, Voices, Voices of Light is um, a piece for um, basically um, everything but the kitchen sink. And if I could have figured out how to make the kitchen sink portable, I would have included that as well. It's got... Um, four female singers, four female medieval singers, um, uh, I'm sorry, four singers, soprano, alto, tenor, bass, four medieval singers, um, soprano, soprano, alto, alto, uh, an immense chorus, a large orchestra, a silent film, and a digital sampler. And uh, basically it was, the um, uh, piece was conceived as a celebration of Joan of Arc. What happened was that I was looking for a subject 
to do a large piece about religion. And I wanted to do something about a religious figure that was, um, shall we say, um, a little unusual, that wasn't, that wasn't somebody who you could immediately peg in some sort of way. And um, my friend Galen Brandt, the singer of the Summit of Laverna, who's here with us today, suggested that I um, look into Joan of Arc's life. And I thought that was an absolutely terrible idea. Um, I thought I didn't know anything about Joan at all, um, but I kind of put the idea away. And then I was researching a completely different piece in the Museum of Modern Art Film Archive. And I saw a still from the film and uh, from this film called The Passion of Joan of Arc. And I said, oh, Joan of Arc, uh, my friend Galen, you know, she says, she says I should know more about, about Joan and do a piece. Let me look at this film. So I screened the film and I couldn't believe it. It was one of the greatest movies ever made. I'd never seen it before, never heard of it before. And um, I, uh, by the end of the movie, I realized that Joan was my subject and that I had to do a very large piece using the movie as the basis of the piece, but do my own music. If it, if it was going to synchronize with the movie, fine, but I would do my own piece about Joan of Arc inspired by the film. So the first question that, that one has after having this kind of realization that you're going to do a piece like that is, well, what, what am I going to say about Joan of Arc? And that, and there, that was a very, very easy um, decision. What kind of instruments are you gonna use? Uh, the only thing I knew about Joan prior to seeing the movie was that she heard voices. So I knew that there would be voices in the movie. What would they sing? You know, would they be um, uh, a vocalese like I had done for Galen? I decided no, and then I had the next idea, which is that they would sing the words of medieval female mystics from Joan of Arc's time. So the next step was to go and find out what, whether or not there was any, there were any uh, female medieval mystics. I knew absolutely not nothing about this and whether or not they had written anything they had. Um, and I read about 4,000 pages of text and chose the text for, the, for, for this um, piece. I'll make a very long story short and just describe, set up the, the, um, the piece, the, the section that you're going to see. Um, this will be synchronized with the film. And this particular section comes about a third of the way through the movie. And it's a scene that's set, um, please don't worry, you'll see nothing horrible. Um, but it, it's a very intense scene, but it's set as they show Joan of Arc the instruments of torture. And the scene is really very, very straightforward and suspenseful. But I decided to do something with the music that was slightly different, which was rather than writing scary music for it, I decided to write rapturous music for it. And the words that I chose are words that have something different, that have a different meaning that, than, the word, than what is going on in the film. They are constantly singing about their ecstasy in terms of all the flagellations and all the terrible things that, that um, medieval monks um, and nuns did in order to get closer to Christ. So the idea was to create a kind of ambiguity about the entire experience of this, uh, of, of being shown the instruments of torture. And um, this is performed by the Netherlands Radio's um, Symphony Orchestra and Chorus. It's available on Sony Classical and it's also available as a, as a, as a Blu-ray and as a DVD on Criterion in, in an extraordinary edition. And I think that's about it. I mean, I could talk about it. There are many questions that I can answer about it, but I think maybe the best thing to do is just see the, see the, see the clip.
It's hard to even speak. It's like going into a really intense meditation. You need time to kind of enter back into the world, I think. But since our time is limited, I will do that and ask uh, uh, again, Trent and Alejandro, for you to respond. And Alejandro, you're unmuted, so why don't you start? Uh, yeah, it's, it's very powerful. Um, it's almost hard to watch because you know it's 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 uh, it's a historical fact and. And it shows the just the, the the brutality that that humans are capable of, and also the the terrible treatment of of women through through history, and it's all that kind of coming together in one place. Uh, and the only thing that saves it is the beautiful music <laughs> that you know. It's so it's so it just takes it to a in, to a different place, a place of transcendence. And I think that's what. Perhaps uh, uh, I could be wrong, but maybe uh, Richard was aiming for, and he he achieved. You know, you you forget about the those instruments of death, and you think about the transcendence that his that that the John of 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 our, of our excuse me is going through in this experience, which I think is extraordinary. Um, I remember, and it's just a personal anecdote. When I was a teenager in Mexico, um, I uh, probably. Uh, I regret this, but but I, anyway, I went. It was an exhibit of medieval uh, torture instruments in going around uh, the country, and I happened to go and see it, and I just couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe what again what humans um, are capable of, and and how um, I guess well the church in this case kind of ripped apart spirituality from from religion just it just it took it just took it all from took it took it away from religion i mean the religion became became meaningless because you know how how can you find anything more distant from from spirituality than 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 that torture it's just the most awful thing but again just going back to the music um 
it's just uh, i think they put you in a in a in a in a, tra um, in a trance of sorts you know this sublime music that that it's more powerful than than the the act of of torture i don't know if, if that makes sense you know it just the music transcends even even that well um I'm a huge fan of silent films. Um, as I mentioned before, I've accompanied lots of silent films. And I think that modern audiences would be um, pleasantly surprised, at least those who are open to it, at how extraordinary uh, silent films, or I should say the best of the genre are. Um, I think that a lot of times when people think of silent films, they think of, um, you know, black and white, uh, overacting, uh, special effects that aren't up to date, you know, and these, these kinds of things are actually secondary in terms of, I think, storytelling. And one of the important things I think in storytelling when it comes to silent films is that the music can, can make or break the film. And I have certainly, uh, I have a huge CD collection of films, uh, this one included. Um, and I have a few that, uh, you know, it's a, it's a film of a, of, of, a, of a silent film, great story, let's say Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And the people who put it together, they say, well, let's see, we need some organ music. So let's say choose a few random preludes and fugues and some uh, chorale preludes and just kind of link them together for six, 70 minutes. And that's the music that accompanies the film. And it is, it is uh, you know, that kind of approach is just uh, kills the art form and is completely unfulfilling and a successful, a successfully directed film can be lost by uh, uh, poor treatment. And I think here we find an artist who understands how the music can and how can and how it will support the drama and adds to the action on the, on the screen and creates intensity when there should be intensity and when there should be tenderness, how does the music uh, um, uh, illustrate that? Uh, and when it's a chase scene, how, what kind of music do you use for that? And, there's a, and I think that actually the job of actually writing down all of this is probably a little more difficult when you're improvising on an organ because when you're improvising, you're looking at the screen and it's like, okay, the screen, the scene, the scene changed. Well, you change the music immediately. But if you've written, uh, you know, 60 seconds of music and the scene is only 50 seconds, well, how do you, how do you cut it short and trends? I mean, so uh, my hat's off to you, Richard, because I know that uh, just dealing with the length of scenes and the music uh, um, for each of the scenes must be uh, a difficult thing. Um, but I think that your use of instrumentation, your use of voices, your use of percussion, uh, those kinds of effects in this particular scene and also throughout the entire uh, silent film, which I have seen several times, um, I think it's it, it adds to the drama, it makes it more real, it makes the story come alive, it makes you almost a witness to history because of the success of the marrying of music and the film itself. So uh, hats off to you for, uh, for creating a, a fine work of art. Would you like to comment, Richard? Oh boy, uh, again, I feel like, how can I follow any of that? Um, the, what I can say, uh, what I'll say is this, that um, it was a, an experience that changed my life um, completely, um, writing this music um, and uh, getting it performed. There, there is so much, you know, um, buried in Dreyer's film, Carl Theodore Dreyer is the director, that performance uh, by Joan, uh, the actress is Renee Falconetti and uh, she is, um, that performance is one of the most studied performances by an actor and has been often used as the basis for many other things. The, the film is really extraordinary in itself. For me, um, getting to know Joan of Arc uh, quite, quite well, if I may say so, I, I really went on a journey for this. Uh, once I realized that I was going to do this piece, um, uh, it, I went to, um, I took a research trip to France I did, um, I went to Joan of Arc's hometown. I went to the scene of her major battles. I went to the, I went to Rouen, which is where um, Joan of Arc was uh, tried and, and uh, burned. And um, I did an immense amount of research on, on, on Joan and on Dreyer. And it really was um, an extraordinary thing to do. 
the the film the the music has often been used um, for other things. It's been choreographed several times, including um, the entire the entire piece, um, including um, a chore um, a including at least twice with Joan of Arc as the subject. Um, it's also today, by sheer coincidence, somebody wrote me from France wanting to use um, some of the music in the film, uh, in in one of their in one of their films. So it's it's kind of had a life of its own, and um, it's been uh, been quite 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 a journey. I'm I'm more than happy to answer more questions about it, in if, if some if anybody has any specific questions about it. Sure. Well, why don't we take the opportunity to turn to questions now? I have a lot more myself, but I'd much rather hear from everybody else and have uh, everybody else have the opportunity to ask questions of all three of you, or particularly about Voices of Light. Um, would anybody like to ask specifically about Voices of Light before we move to more general questions for Richard, Alejandro, and Trent? And you can either raise your hand like this, or you can use the icon, or you can put a question in the chat. Um, so I will, I will then, um, I'm sorry if I, I'm just trying to scan and see if I see you. A lot of people are not on video. And of course, if you're not on video and you'd like to ask, just unmute, it's fine. We'll, I'll be glad to navigate that if you'd like to do that. But I do have a question in the chat that was sent to me from Venerable Tenzin, not specifically about Voices of Light, but she would like to know, I think from all three of you, although Venerable, you can suggest if there's somebody in particular you wanted to ask, she writes, writers sometimes say that doing daily writing, inspired or not, is almost like doing push-ups, preparing your mind for the times when you will be in an otherworldly place. Do you experience something like that? So Richard, why don't you start? Venerable, hello, how are you? Uh, Venerable Pell Young's with our, with our um, Dharma Center and uh, most treasured, treasured friend. Um, the, um, it's funny you should mention that uh, because I just wrote an article about um, how I do morning pages every morning and I get up and the first thing that I do um, even before meditation is write three pages a day, uh, longhand uh, words. Um, but yes, absolutely. Writing every day is, is writing every day, composing every day is critical. I wish I could say that I did that every day, but I try to. And I notice that, that if I'm writing for um, a week, uh, for two weeks, for three weeks at a time, oh, it gets so, so much faster. It really starts to flow because you're just constantly familiar with your, you know, the ideas that are coming through. Hmm. Uh, I think for myself, um, I wish that I could have that daily discipline. <laughs> uh, I know that I've had that discipline when it comes to, you know, playing a keyboard instrument, keeping your technique, exercises, scales, uh, repertoire, keeping your memory fresh. Um, I think that um, there's so many, I have so many interests uh, in music and without of mu out of music that I, I find that sort of daily discipline of composing to be not so... Um, uh, the best way for me. Um, maybe I'm a binger. <laughs> I won't write for a week, but then I'll disappear for three months. <laughs> and then when it's over, I've got, you know, 40 pages of something. Uh, so, you know, there are different styles and that seems to work for me. And it's interesting. I could be writing a piece and spend, you know, six weeks on it and then put it aside and then come back to it after four weeks. And it's like, I haven't left. So somehow my brain is able to maintain a connection there, but I think I might consider myself more of a binger. I, I just, um, it's all for nothing kind of thing. That, that's, it just seems to work for me. <laughs> Alejandro, do you wanna share your approach? Um, I, don't, I don't have much, much to add. I mean, you know, there are composers that, that insisted that writing a little bit every day was very important, like Brahms, for example, that we talked about. But others like Mahler that were extremely successful only wrote during the summer. Mahler wrote all his great symphonies, all, all nine of them, and part of the 10th during the summer. That's all he got time for because he was conducting all over the world all the time. So the summer he would rent a hut somewhere with a lake at, in front of him and a mountain behind him and just disappear, as Trent was saying, for three months and then come up with something extraordinary. <laughs> well, thank you for, for that. It's, it's so 
wonderful to hear about your process and to know how varied it can be, you know, especially for those of us who are bingers like Trent, or those of us who are sort of slog their way through each day. 